I'll give a little bit of a summary to kind of settle us in the present topic. And so first, um, this whole discussion of the paramitas, the six perfections, is kind of centered in what we call the practice of the bodhisattva. And a bodhisattva is someone who has gender generated the mind of bodhicitta, which means the mind of awakening, the mind of enlightenment. And that is an intention. It's an intention. It's also a set of practices that align with that intention. So there's uh, bodhicitta in aspiration and bodhicitta in action or bod engaged bodhicitta and aspirational bodhicitta. So this engaged bodhicitta is the intention to free all beings from suffering and bring them to the state of enlightenment. And so the very beginning of the teaching, normally you'll hear our teachers encourage people to generate that intention. And I would do the same for you now. That even if you're here just kind of out of curiosity, uh, or if you're here thinking maybe you can gain something for yourself, the attitude of bodhicitta is one that encompasses, you know, this wish to free all beings from suffering, bring them all to enlightenment. You are included in that all beings. It's not like you're wishing for other people and not yourself. So Ken Ramsey always says, you know, if you can wish something great for everyone, why would you only wish it for yourself? So I would encourage everyone to uh, to start with that intention, the intention of, you know, that you're going to listen to these teachings, maybe take something home from these teachings with the aspiration that that could be something meaningful in your spiritual development, that that could be meaningful in liberating all beings from suffering <clears throat> and bringing them to the state of enlightenment. So with that, um, we'll kind of come back around um, where we left off last time. So we were talking about this general idea of bodhicitta. We have this aspirational intention of bodhicitta. And then we have these six practices, which are how we engage in that. How, how do we work with this intention? If we have an intention to free beings from suffering, to bring them to enlightenment, how do we start making steps on that path? And so first, um, the six perfections are aligned or arranged in an order of easiest to most difficult to kind of master or to develop. And so we start with generosity. And in generosity, it's not merely giving something, but it's as with all of the perfections, there are kind of some qualities that that make them a perfection. And one of those qualities is that the, that practice has to serve as an antidote to its opposite. Uh, and what that means in the case of generosity is that your act of generosity, generosity should be acting as a an agent of kind of suppressing or reducing or eliminating your greed and covetousness. Uh, and for example, with discipline, which is the second of the six perfections, by practicing discipline, that should be kind of suppressing or subduing or eliminating your harmful or destructive behavior, the behavior that is causing more obstacles in your life or more obstacles in your spiritual development. Uh, and now third, moving into patience, the opposite or the counter the counter factor to patience is anger. And so uh, the practice of patience in this tradition, in this context, is considered the practice for, generally speaking, overcoming anger. But there's more to it than that, as we will discover as we go into the main topic. And so uh, in this whole kind of world... Um, of, of the practice of the bodhisattva or the practice of someone who has this intention of the mind of enlightenment of bodhicitta, then the whole discussion of the practice of patience isn't merely for a discussion of, oh yeah, it would be better not to be angry, but from the context of in this, the development of a person who's seeking enlightenment on this path of the bodhisattva with the intention of bodhicitta, you see that anger is one of the worst, like most counterproductive and destructive forces that could completely obstruct your capacity to actually develop in the direction of this intention of bodhicitta. And so that's what where this discussion is centered in. Of course, for our day-to-day -day lives, anger is destructive. It's harmful. It hurts us and it hurts others. It ruins our relationships. Of course, even in a worldly sense, patience is great. We should, you know, I, I say should, it would be really healthy and helpful to ourselves and our relationships and everyone around us if we develop it. But the specific discussion of patience in terms of the perfection of patience or in terms of this discussion of the paramitas is coming from the perspective of what is going to aid the development of a person on the path of the bodhisattva 
what is going to help them to ripen and nurture other beings on their path of spiritual development, what is going to lead to this person and other pers other people's um, expansion of their compassion and wisdom and understanding and so forth. And so it is kind of within that context that you find the discussion of the, the paramitas or these perfections. So of course, generosity is great for anyone, regardless of whether you care about enlightenment or even believe in the idea of enlightenment or not. Um, having some sense of like personal discipline, like I'm not going to harm others. I'm going to be honest with others. I'm not going to cheat on my partner, all those kind of things. Those are obviously, you know, healthy secular ethics. You could even say, like, I would say Buddhist ethics are secular ethics, by the way, um, because they're not commandments from the Buddha. All of the so-called ethics of Buddhism are things that the Buddha said, if you do this, this kind of thing is going to happen, and that's going to create an obstacle to your path of spiritual development. So if you don't want that obstacle or those problematic situations to come about, you shouldn't do those actions that would create that type of situation. So he didn't say, don't kill. He didn't say, don't steal. He said, if you steal, this is going to happen. So think for yourself, but you probably don't want to do that. You know. So they're just, they're more like ways of training than they are rules of conduct. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, in my perspective, yeah, maybe you're divorcing it from secularism. If you're talking about enlightenment or whatever, these kind of things, maybe these are religious or spiritual ideas, but um, I would say it's not um, an, a system of ethics or something like that based on the commands of a deity or something like that. You're, it, there's no, there's no sense of like, if you don't do it, you're going to hell because you're breaking the command of a god or something like that there is a sense there is a sense however in buddhism that you will experience possibly incredible amounts of suffering such that it could be described as a hell type of perspective or a hell type of situation if you kill and steal and lie and cheat and do all of these things that there's going to be you know a very negative experience that will come as a result of that but it's because that's just the reality of the effects of those types of actions and not because you're being punished for breaking the command of a deity or something like that. So anyway, that was a side point. That was a tangent. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, but just coming back around. So we were, um, you know, you first practice generosity, which is the easiest one to practice because, um, yeah, maybe on a greater level, it's hard. But like anyone can give a dollar to someone or can help their friend carry some things or can even like share some food with someone or whatever. You can start very simply in the, in the text. It even says for people who are um, there's a, there's a story of one King in the time of the Buddha who was so stingy that he couldn't help the, the people of his kingdom at all. And he was so stingy that like the Buddha first taught him, I want you to just imagine you're giving something to someone else, but actually just take the thing and hand it from your left hand to your right. And just practice giving and just imagining that you're giving to someone else. And then from there, he gradually trained to be able to actually give something to someone. And ultimately, the story goes that his kingdom became very prosperous because he developed a sense of generosity. So anyway, anyone can practice generosity from like very simple level up to, you know, higher and higher levels. Second, discipline's much harder. It's, it's much harder to, um, it's much harder to kind of <clears throat> make a commitment to refraining from certain actions or engaging in certain kind of positive actions, um, and especially refraining from negative actions that we might have deep, you know, habits of, than it is just to give someone a dollar or to help someone with a project or whatever, any kind of generosity. Third, moving into the perfection of patience, it's even harder than, uh, it's even harder to um, to not get upset, which is kind of the essence of patience. We're going to, I'll define patience here in a minute and get more into its kind of characteristics, but it's even harder to not get upset with someone than it is to maintain some kind of sense of personal discipline. And so they, this is the kind of the process. Um, and then the next of the, of the perfections after this one, which we'll talk about next month is the perfection of diligence. And so um, that's even harder. The next is meditative concentration, which is even harder. And the last is uh, wisdom, which is considered the hardest. And so all of the previous ones are considered methods for developing the subsequent ones. So you could say that each one is serving kind of as a cause for helping to develop the next one. So they're all kind of supporting each other as you move up into the more and more difficult practices. Ultimately, wisdom is the most difficult 
And there are quotes like from Shantideva in The Way of the Bodhisattva, which is a famous text that everyone in the Tibetan tradition studies for learning about bodhicitta and the, the perfections and the trainings in bodhicitta and all this kind of stuff, where he says that all of the first five perfections were all taught as methods for developing wisdom. So that's just some more framing for like this whole context of the discussion of the perfections.